Hello and welcome to HIV.gov's coverage of AIDS 2018, the International AIDS Conference in Amsterdam. I'm Steve Holman and we're gathered here today with over 15,000 members of the HIV community from around the world. Researchers, program implementers, public health experts, policy makers, and other members of the HIV affected community. They hail from over 160 different countries and over the next week will be participating in more than 500 sessions, workshops, and other activities, all focused on aspects of our efforts to treat and prevent HIV. As the conference gets underway, we're delighted to be able to begin our coverage with an interview here with Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institutes of Health in Washington, DC. Welcome, Dr. Fauci, it's nice to have you. It's good to be here. So I understand that uh, you've been working in the field since the very beginning of the epidemic, and that in fact you've attended every single one of the international conferences since the first one in 1985 in Atlanta? That's correct. That's, yeah. that's, that's amazing. Correct. Yeah. Um, a lot of conferences, a lot has happened, that's for sure. Well, and, and to that point, um, how would you characterize uh, the spirit of this year's conference compared to some of those earlier meetings? Well, you know, it, it's a mixed bag because there's so much that has been done and accomplished, particularly in the area of the individual treatment that's available to people and the drugs we have, pre-exposure prophylaxis, treatment as prevention. But there's also a sobering note to realize that we still have an implementation gap in implementing to people who need it the, the scientific tools that have been proven to be effective. And when you know we've heard this issue about ending the HIV AIDS epidemic, and one of the things that's become clear that just saying that we can end the AIDS epidemic doesn't mean we're gonna end it. Absolutely. There needs a lot that needs to be done and a lot that is not being done that we have to make sure we do. So there's a combination of celebrating the advances that we've made, but realizing and confronting the extraordinary challenges that we have. Indeed. To that end, what do you think are some of the themes that are going to dominate the scientific program here at the conference this year? Well, the scientific program is going to be multifaceted, but a couple of the things that emerged is how do we get treatments in a way that's more user-friendly, such as long-acting long antiretrovirals, either for treatment individuals who are on therapy but don't like taking a single pill a day, or people who are at risk and were wanting to be on some sort of a pre-exposure prophylaxis, mm -hmm. but again, want to do better than just a single pill a day. And those are the long acting. The other thing is these broadly neutralizing antibodies that have now been perfected. They've been able to be used in humans. There have been a number of phase one trials showing that you can give them to HIV infected individuals and lower the viral load. And there's a big study that's going on now in Southern Africa in which you passively transfer broadly neutralizing antibodies mm -hmm. and see if it can actually prevent infections. These are the kind of things that are gonna be talking about. Obviously, there's gonna be a number of studies looking at cure. We haven't come close to a cure. The idea about eradicating HIV is very problematic. I'm going to talk a little bit in my own uh, uh, plenary mm -hmm. session on an art-free remission. In other words, how can we maintain someone in remission without necessarily giving them daily antiretroviral therapy? That's a big challenge, but I think it's doable. So there's a whole variety of things that are going to be discussed. And yesterday you delivered a uh, lecture about uh, ending the epidemic, some considerations for individuals and others. Can you right. tell us a little bit about what you spoke to yesterday? Well, what I spoke about to a group of journalists yesterday was, I think, something that's pervading the theme uh, of the conference. And that is, if you look at HIV in two lenses, one is for the individual patient who has the fortune to be able to be in a system in which they can get antiretroviral therapy accessible to them or at-risk persons who have pre-exposure prophylaxis. The science has brought us to the point where we've completely transformed it from where we were decades ago. On the other side of the coin, the point I made is that we still have a major challenge in ending the epidemic as an epidemiological phenomenon. Mm. So we have the tools for the individual person, but we need to implement that for globally in regions and countries throughout the world. So that was the point I was trying to make, that we've accomplished a lot, but the challenges are still profound. So the tools are there, but not yet at the scale or the reach right. that we need them to be. Right, yeah, and then one of the other th things that I had in another talk that I gave yesterday was the issue about U equals U, the, uh, undetectable means untransmissible. The data that are accumulating now 
are really rather strong. I think there's very little doubt in anyone's mind that if you are truly undetectable, that you will not transmit the virus to your sexual partner, which is very good news from a variety of standpoints. Absolutely. There was a lot of energy at that uh, session. I was there listening to you and stayed for the rest of the day. Uh, uh, you were referenced several times after you left. They were, they were quite pleased with uh, having had the opportunity to hear from you and, and that review, thorough review of the scientific evidence uh, of, of you equals you. Right. So you were, you were getting rave reviews. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, are there particular scientific presentations that are going to take place here at the conference that you're especially interested in learning more about and, and why? Well, I, I certainly want to hear a little bit more, and we already know about it, but it's nice to see it presented, about some of the vaccine, the very early vaccine candidates, the idea of being able to take the envelope of HIV and make that an immunogen to be able to induce the kind of response that you would like to uh, induce. There are also a lot of other things that aren't fundamental basic science that are more along the area of epidemiology and trends of the epidemic. Uh, I'm very interested and in people need to pay attention to the fact that even in areas where you're implementing PEPFO and the Global Fund, we've got to be very careful and you're going to be hearing talks about it. even countries that reached 90, 90, 90, which we have put up as the landmark for success. Mm -hmm. And it is. It's something we should uh, 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 strive for. 90% of people who are infected are diagnosed, 90% are on therapy, and 90% of those are suppressed below detectable level with regard to their viral load. But the one thing we have to be careful of is that there are special populations within countries, within regions, which are very difficult to access. So they mm. may, be, may be that less than 10% who are actually driving the epidemic. So the idea about looking at it not in the sense of if we achieve 90, 90, 90, we're good to go. It's that we've got to go beyond 90, 90, 90. We've got to access those special populations. And it isn't only in the developing world. I mean, if you look at, let's say, take as a prototype country, South Africa, mm -hmm. and you look at the KwaZulu-Natal section, where you have young women who have a prevalence of infection that's stunningly high, up to 40% yep. in women who are between the ages of 18 and 23, 24. They're being infected by older men who infect them. They then, a couple of years later, infect their peer group, which are younger men, who then get older and infect the younger women. It's a vicious cycle that's very difficult to break. In the United States, a developed country, we still have a special populations issue. If you look at the map mm -hmm. of the United States, 52% of the infections are occurring in relatively few counties that tend to cluster in the southern and southeastern part of the United States. And that's a very difficult group to access. Mostly African-American, mostly men who have sex with men, mm -hmm. who are stigmatized against, which makes it very difficult to access them. So what I'm gonna be hearing about, and I want everyone else to hear about, is those kind of special challenges of access and getting people into care. And that's one of the interesting things about this conference, because not only do we have some of the world's best HIV researchers here, we also have policymakers, we have program implementers, we have people living with HIV, we have people at risk of HIV, all coming together to hear this information together, right. share some of those strategies about how they might overcome some of the challenges right. that you just cited. Right, exactly. exactly. In fact, we heard a session this morning that Mark Dibel chaired that was talking about how you integrate HIV care and HIV uh, attempts to address it with the broader global health issues because early on when, when we were perceiving appropriately that HIV was a very special problem, it was HIV exceptionalism. We would focus just on HIV. Mm -hmm. What's becoming clear now that there are many other health problems that we need to integrate within our attempts of addressing HIV, which will be better for HIV and better for the other diseases. So we're talking more about an integrative response at this particular meeting. And better for the health of all of those communities oh, as well. Absolutely. Well, not one of the pre-planned questions, but speaking of Mark Dybul, and since we're here overlooking the U.S. government PEPFAR right. anniversary booth, um, many of our viewers are uh, from the domestic side of things. And one of the fascinating things about being here at the conference is we're reminded of the global scope of the epidemic and particularly the U.S. response to it through the PEPFAR program, which you and Dr. Dybul helped organize. Right. Can you give our uh, viewers just a thumbnail history of the work that you two did uh, with well, President Bush? you know, back in 2002, the President George W. Bush asked me to come to Africa 
and try and determine the feasibility of putting together a transforming huge program that would make a major impact on HIV, particularly in Southern Africa, but also in other developing countries. So mm -hmm. I came back, I looked at it, we created a model, uh, we put it together, we picked a group of countries that would represent more than 50% of the infections in the world, and we worked on it for several months from the spring of 2002 until the end of 2002, and to his great credit, President Bush accepted that proposal. We decided to call it PEPFAR. Mark and I worked on it for several months up until the point when he announced it at the State of the Union address. And now we have a program 15 years later, which has been clearly the most transforming global health program in, the, in, in history in so yeah. many respects for a single disease. That is, I had the, the pleasure and the privilege of being invited by President George W. Bush just a couple of months ago to go to Dallas where his presidential institute is and mm -hmm. celebrate the 15th anniversary of PEPFAR. And we went over the numbers, and the numbers are astounding. 14 million people have received antiretroviral drugs. 16 million infections have been prevented. You put that together, Amazing. 30 million lives have been saved by the program. So programs such as PEPFAR, which is a, a, an extraordinary example, I think should be a signal to the world that when you get leadership of a country, to put a major commitment in intention and resources mm -hmm. the way the president did it with the United States and the Global Fund, including multilateral, multiple countries, we can actually do it. I mean, there's no reason why. People said you couldn't do PEPFAR. You couldn't get drugs to people in the developing world. And PEPFAR proved them completely incorrect. You can. Yeah, and really rich partners, partnerships with all of the, the local host countries and, right. and uh, community governments throughout each of those as well. Right. We'll be hearing a lot about those uh, outcomes here at the conference, particularly as we celebrate the 15th anniversary of PEPFAR. Um, the conference is a great forum that comes together every two years to talk about uh, different aspects of HIV research and its implementation around the globe. But the research that you oversee at uh, NIAID continues day after day, week after week, it year does. after year. What are some of the research priorities uh, in the coming year that you're particularly enthused about? Well, the thing that we're all looking forward to, it's a formidable scientific problem, is the developing a safe and effective vaccine. Because a vaccine, even one that is not 98% effective the way measles and polio and smallpox is, but one that is 55, 60% effective. If you combine that with the non-vaccine prevention modalities that we have, like treatment and prevention and pre-exposure prophylaxis, we could finally put a nail in the coffin of HIV. So the, the amount of energy and resources that are being put into developing a, a HIV vaccine is are extraordinary. That's not the only thing we're doing. Obviously, we want to get better drugs. We want to be able to get people who are on drug to not have to take it every single day. And that's where the long-acting long -acting. antivirals come in. Yep. That's where the passive transfer of broadly neutralizing antibody. Those are the kind of things, among many others, that are really at the top of the list of priorities. It's going to be an exciting year or two ahead. And I think so. Maybe some results from those studies at well, the, the next conference. Well, the, actually, the, we should be seeing some results from the, both the passive transfer of antibody, which is called the AMP study, antibody-mediated mm -hmm. prevention, uh, as well as the vaccine studies in, South, in Southern Africa somewhere by the end of 2020 and the early part of 2021. So it won't be next year, but perhaps the following year. Terrific. That'll be exciting stuff yeah. to look, look forward to. We are. Well, thank you very much for taking time to join My us. Pleasure. I know you've got a super busy schedule here at the conference, so we really appreciate you making time to uh, join us. It's always good to be with you. Thank you. And stay with us for more coverage over the next four days from here at the International AIDS Conference in Amsterdam. Uh, Follow us on here on Facebook, check out HIV.gov's blog for more details, and you can follow us on social media. We'll be back soon.